please uh, welcome Vermont introduce. Senator Bernie Sanders. Oh. Thanks for being here. I, uh, oh, I want to get right to, uh, right to our, our questions from our audience. This is Richard Katz. He's from Needham, Massachusetts. He works in the restaurant industry. Richard, uh, welcome. How you doing? Good evening. Thank Sorry you. Sorry for the uh, confusion over here. Hey, Frank, you're about to... Yeah, Be careful. <laughs> Daniel. Okay. There we go. I have large feet. <laughs> There's a joke in there, but I'm not saying anything. <laughs> Senator, your climate plan is specific about how you will spend $16 trillion, and I'm delighted that somebody's willing to spend that much. Can you be equally specific about where that money is coming from? For example, you say that you will tax fossil fuel companies, but the central idea behind addressing climate change is eliminating use of fossil fuels. How much money can you raise from companies whose income will be drastically reduced or eliminated, Good. and where else will the money come from? Good. How are you going to pay uh, for If it? I could, Richard, is it, yeah. 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 Let, let me begin I'm predicating everything I'm going to say to you this evening. Uh, Donald Trump thinks that climate change is a hoax. I think that Donald, Tra Donald Trump is dangerously, dangerously wrong. Uh, I may be old fashioned, but I believe in science. And, and Richard, as I'm sure you know, what the scientists have told us, climate change is real. It is caused by human activity. It is already causing devastating problems in this country and around the world. And most frighteningly, what they tell us is if we don't get our act together and make massive changes away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy within the next 11 years, the damage done to our country and the rest of the world will be irreparable. So Richard is quite right. We are proposing the largest, most comprehensive climate change program ever presented by any candidate in the history of the United States. So where do we get, and let me, even before I tell you where we get the money, and I will do that, people say, well, Bernie, you know, you're spending a lot of money. Is it realistic? And my response to them is, is it realistic to not listen to the scientists and to create a situation where the planet that our children and grandchildren and future generations will be living in will be increasingly uninhabitable and unhealthy. Is that realistic? So I think we have a moral responsibility to act and act boldly. And to do that, yes, it is going to be expensive. This is how we get the money for a start, insanely, but honestly, what goes on right now is we are giving the fossil fuel industry approximately $400 billion every single year in subsidies and tax breaks. Obviously, we end that. And we are paying for this over a 15-year period, by the way. Second of all, uh, we believe that the federal government is the best way to move aggressively to produce sustainable energy like wind and solar. We will expand concepts, public power concepts like the TVA right now to produce wind and solar and actually make a profit on that as we sell that to electric companies all over the world. Thirdly, we are not going to have to spend money uh, on the military uh, defending oil interests around the world. Good. We Good. can cut military Finally. spending there as well. All right. Yeah, that's how we're going to pay for it, honey. Fourthly, Fourthly, our program will create up to 20 million good paying jobs uh, over the period of the 15 years. And when we do that, you're going to have a lot of taxpayers out there who will be paying more in taxes. You'll have people who are not getting food stamps and so forth. So those are the basic ways that we pay for this program. But most importantly, we are dealing with what the scientists call an existential threat to this planet. And we must respond aggressively. We must listen to the scientists. That is what our plan does. I think there's... there's... There's folks out who just heard you say talk about higher taxes and taxpayers out there paying more. Would you guarantee on that one, the American public sentence. tonight that 
the responsibility for $16.3 trillion, which is a massive amount of money, wouldn't end up on taxpayers' shoulders? Well, it'll end up on some taxpayers' shoulders. If you are in the fossil fuel industry, you're going to be paying more in taxes, that's for sure. Yeah. And I happen to believe in general that at a time when we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality, where the richest three people in this country own more wealth than the bottom half of American society, where major profitable corporations like Amazon, who made over 10 billion in profits last year, didn't pay a nickel in taxes. Am I gonna guarantee Jeff Bezos he's not gonna be paying more in taxes? No, I won't. Uh, I want you... I want you to meet... Uh... Justine Burfond, is it? Burfond, yeah. Good. Justine Burfond from Brooklyn. She's a student at New York University, a volunteer with the Sunrise Movement, which is a youth climate group. Justine, welcome. Hi, Senator Sanders. It's really nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> my family has lived in southern Brooklyn for four generations. In 2012, I witnessed Hurricane Sandy ravage this area. Uh, you have wavered at times in your stance on eliminating the filibuster. How do you intend to implement the climate policy we need to prevent climate disasters like That's Sandy? Not- if bad actors like Senator Mitch McConnell intend to use the filibuster to block climate legislation. I haven't wavered. I haven't wavered. What I believe is the Senate should not be the House and we shouldn't simply have a majority body. But what I have said repeatedly is we need major filibuster reform. And second of all, just as Bush got through major tax breaks for the rich through the Budget Reconciliation Act, we can do that as well. So if your question is, and we're gonna need 60 votes to save the planet, the answer is no, we will not. There are ways There are ways to get that to the Budget Reconciliation Act, which will require 51 votes, and that's the method we will use, um, okay? I want you to meet uh, Mark Alessi, he's yeah. a graduate student. Mark. Stu- Mark. Hey, Mark. Alessi, he's a graduate student studying climate science at Cornell University, currently supports Senator Elizabeth Warren. Mark. Hey, Mark. Thank you, Senator Sanders. In your Green New Deal plan, you argue that nuclear energy is, quote, a false solution to the climate crisis. However, going forward, we will need every tiny contribution from all renewable energy sources, especially since nuclear energy production doesn't depend on the time of day or the current weather conditions. How can you dismiss this technology when it will be necessary in any drastic switch in our country's energy infrastructure? Thank you, Mark. Well, here's the answer. Mark, we got a heck of a lot of nuclear waste, which as you know, is gonna stay around this planet for many, many, many thousands of years. And you know what? We don't know how to get rid of it right now. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to add more dangerous waste to this country uh, and to the world when we don't know how to get rid of what we have right now. Number two, in terms of cost, the truth is that it costs a lot more to build a new nuclear power plant today than it does to go to solar uh, or to go to wind. So yeah, I think right. that it is safer and more cost effective to move to sustainable energies like wind, solar, and geothermal uh, and not nuclear. We have, a, we have another follow-up question about nuclear power uh, from our chief climate correspondent, Bill Weir. Bill? Yeah, Senator, I want to follow on Mark's question there. Uh, currently, right now, the U.S. gets about 20% of our electricity and power uh, from nuclear, nuclear while France about yeah. is about 70%. Granted, they have much fewer reactors than we do, but do you really believe the French are that much more at risk uh, as we stand here tonight? And of what exactly? And since uh, renewables like solar and wind Renewable. take so much more land, how can you possibly go carbon neutral without nuclear well, in the short term? I, mean, I think the scientists tell us, in fact, that we can. And I think if you talk to the people in Japan in terms of what happened at Fukushima, mm-hmm. talk to the people in Russia what happened in Chernobyl, All right. you know what? they may not feel so comfortable with nuclear power. So I'm not a fear monger here, and I wish the people in France the very best. But I think that the well done. way forward, well done. the most cost effective way forward, the way forward that is uh, safest is moving to sustainable energies like uh, wind and geothermal. Senator Sanders, uh, just today, the Trump administration announced plans to overturn requirements on energy-saving light bulbs. Uh, It's obviously a move that could increase greenhouse gas emissions. Would you reinstate those requirements as Uh, president? (laughs) (laughs) Look. You know, it is... I guess I should have asked, how fast would you reinstate those requirements? It's fast. Look, one of the great things that's happening, and, and which gives us some hope, 
is that there has been an explosion in technology in many, many areas that if we have the political will to utilize that technology, uh, we can maybe uh, save the planet. And by the way, let me just say this at this point before I get to light bulbs. And that is everybody in this room knows. I mean, this is a difficult issue. Nobody has a magical solution, I don't. But this is not just an American issue. This is an issue that impacts the entire world. So what I would do, unlike President Trump, who has turned his back on this issue, in fact, made it significantly worse uh, by uh, expanding the use of fossil fuel. What I will do, and I'm not here to tell you that I think it will happen like this, but I think it's worth the try, that in this extraordinary moment of global crisis, I think we need a president, hopefully Bernie Sanders, that reaches out to the world, to Russia and China and India, and Pakistan, all the countries of the world and say, guess what? Whether you like it or not, we are all in this together. And if you are concerned about the children in your country and future generations, we're going to have to work together. And maybe, just maybe, instead of spending a trillion and a half dollars every single year on weapons of destruction designed to kill each other, maybe we pool those resources and we work together against our common enemy, which is climate change. Yeah. So. <laughs> now, you know, one of the tech, actually, I've followed this issue of LED light bulbs and so forth, and there have been huge breakthroughs. I mean, you all know that, that uh, we use a much less electricity. These light bulbs last a lot longer, uh, and it is a major, major breakthrough. But it, that also speaks, uh, Anderson, to the issue of energy efficiency. So it's not just moving to sustainable energies, it is also being much more uh, efficient in terms of the energy that we use. So if you can get electricity from a light bulb that utilizes one-tenth of the power that an old incandescent light bulb used, of course you're going to do that. Of course you're going to encourage that technology. In Vermont, we are making it as easy as possible, helping people buy those light bulbs. Mm -hmm. And it is in my community in Burlington, Vermont, if I am not mistaken, over the last many years, despite good economic growth, we are not spent using any more electricity than we did 10 years ago because we have put investments into energy efficiency. So that's the direction we've got to go. I got to take a quick break. Uh, Senator Sanders, we'll have more right. with uh, the Senator in a moment. We've got more questions, plus Senator Warren, Mayor Pete Buttigieg will take the stage as well. We'll be right back. All right, so uh, first, you know, listening to Bernie Sanders is like music, man. Um, he's once again consistent with his uh, talking points. He's consistent with um, his policies. And, you know, he, again, he proves why he's the front runner. He's the real front runner that corporate media and the DNC just refuse to acknowledge or accept. You're hearing him answer the questions. Compare him to Biden. Biden was rambling on and on and on and on about a whole bunch of BS. And the thing is, with Bernie, he's telling you how he's going to pay for it. He's telling you who's responsible. And also, shout out to Unknown Space Pioneer, one of our Patreon supporters. Thank you for a super chat donation. It goes miles for us. Thank you so much. But I just want to get getting back on point. He's talking about the real danger of climate change. He's talking about how we're going to address it, how we're going to pay for it, and really what happens if we continue to turn a blind eye to ignoring the real threat that climate change basically can, can do to the entire human species. So Bernie Sanders is consistent. He's on point. CNN is trying to take him down. You can tell with the Anderson Cooper questions, as well as uh, with Thank the God Weatherman. Thank for nepotism. Yeah, and also with the Weatherman's questions as well. Because look, let's face it, face it atomic energy, nuclear energy, um, it, it's a hazard. And to be clear, I have a softer stance than most of the other members of the team for thorium specifically. I actually yeah. agree with Andrew Yang on this, but I also, but the point I make with it is, hey, how do we get to... How do we get rid of... My that? big fear is the, like I've said before on the show, are the nuclear power plants there on the coast that take 30 years to decommission that will be underwater in 30 years. That hey, freaks hey, me out. Hey, Daniel, you know, there's a big super hurricane heading towards South Carolina, and a long time ago, when we were on radio, you did a story mm -hmm. about a radioactive plant that is under threat 
of being underwater, the but it also is leaking material into the environment. Yeah, that's the issue that we have mainly is, I think we have another super chat. Uh, yes, A.R. Francis, thanks for this, better than watching TV. And again, this is an audio coverage. Uh, we cannot show video. CM TV will take us down if we yeah. show visual. So it is what it is, but yeah. we will do what we can to make it as entertaining as possible. But to answer your question, the problem is that a lot of the reactors that we put up were from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah. And about the 70s, people got, especially with Three Mile Island, people got really scared of building new nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And here's a really fun one that I remember, that if you build a nuclear power plant, you have to, generally speaking, have a 100-mile exclusion zone around it. Because, you know, the, again, if you watch Chernobyl, it's, we, we do put a lot more safety into our nuclear power plants than, like, Russia did. And that, that's not saying they were perfect. Again, Three Mile yeah. Island. But if you put solar panels in that entire exclusion zone, they would produce more power than the nuclear power plant. Yeah. And there's no chance that they're going to melt down. And, it's, and, it's, and the thing is, you know... The very fact that you have corporate media trying to do some disgusting hit and run tactics on Bernie Sanders by saying that, well, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to address these issues? How are you going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do we do about atomic energy? What do we do about mm -hmm. nuclear energy? You know, it, it shows, it goes to show you that the rig is in. Corporate media is going to try and take them down. But look, guys, we have to go back to the town hall. We'll give our further analysis. Uh, Another question from our audience Martha Readyoff is a teacher from New Milford, Connecticut. Martha, welcome. Good evening. Human population growth has more than doubled in the past 50 years. One the planet Lord. cannot sustain this growth. I realize this is a poisonous topic for politicians, but it's crucial to face. Empowering women and educating everyone on the need to curb population growth seems a reasonable campaign to enact. Would you be courageous enough to discuss this issue and make it a key feature of a plan to address climate catastrophe? Well, Martha, the answer is yes. <laughs> And the answer has everything to do with the fact that women in the United States of America, by the way, have a right to control their own bodies and make reproductive decisions. And the Mexico City Agreement, which denies American aid to those organizations around the world that, are, uh, that allow women to have abortions or even get involved uh, in birth control, to me is totally absurd. So I think, especially in poor countries around the world, uh, where women do not necessarily want to have large numbers of babies, and where they can have the opportunity through birth control to control the number of kids they have, something I very, very strongly uh, support. Uh, I want to uh, I want to introduce uh, 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 sorry our next I guess uh, Grennan uh, Milliken. He's a graduate student at Columbia University studying climate Grenin. and society. Grennan. Grennan. Evening. Um, in order to successfully mitigate the impacts of climate change in the U.S., um, known space we're going to realistically, here. or the U.S. is okay. realistically going to have to wean itself off of fossil fuel use completely. She didn't um, make it. Unfortunately, this can also mean the loss of jobs. Yeah. Uh, how would you help workers of the fossil fuel industry transition to other Good. respectable fields of work? in a future green economy. Thank you very much for that important question. I consider myself to be perhaps the most pro-worker member of the United States Congress. I think mean, I have a 100% pro-union AFL-CIO voting record, and I've spent my entire life fighting for workers. So let me be very clear, uh, is that the coal miners in this Thank country, you, the Thank men and you, women who work on the oil rigs, they are not my enemy. What is my enemy is climate change. And what we have done is built into our uh, plan, our $16 trillion plan, tens and tens of billions of dollars for what we call a just transition. And that says that if some worker, through no fault of his own or her own, loses their job because we're moving away from fossil fuel, we're going to guarantee them an income for five years. We're going to guarantee them the education that they need because those workers are not our enemies. They should not be punished because we're trying to save the planet. Um, I just want to ask, of, 
Of all your ambitious plans, uh, free public college, Medicare for all, eliminating student debt, Keep going. full you employment, yeah. Green New Deal, uh, every president has to prioritize in terms of what they're going to put. Hey, come on. What is the priority on climate change compared to all these others if you have to choose? Well, I, I have the radical idea that a sane Congress can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time. <laughs> and you know, Anderson, there are so many crises that are out there today. Uh, I worry very much uh, that we lose 30,000 people a year because they don't have the money to go to a doctor when they should, and that 87 million people are uninsured or underinsured. And I will implement as president a Medicare for All single payer program. Uh, I am terribly worried that hundreds of thousands of bright kids no longer go to college because they're worried about the debt that they'll incur. We're going to cancel all student debt. So to my mind, it's not prior to prioritizing this over that. It is finally having a government which represents working families and the middle class rather than wealthy campaign contributors. And when you do that, and when you do that, then things fall in place. So you can raise the minimum wage to a living wage. But in terms of this issue, I don't know how any sane person cannot put it at, at the very, very top of the list. So let me say it again. We are, in my view, not in my view, in the view of the scientists who have studied this issue the most, we are fighting for the survival of the planet Earth, our only planet. How is this not a major priority? It must be a major priority. L let me ask you. <laughs> Last month, you tweeted, Donald Trump believes climate change is a hoax. Donald Trump is an idiot. Do you feel... Did I say that? Well... <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> you know, My wife I, thought it wasn't yeah, a good yeah. idea, but I said Well, let, let me ask you, there's saying. obviously tens of millions of Americans who support Donald Trump yeah. and who believe him on climate change. Are they idiots? No. Look, what you got, Donald Trump is the only president of the United States that we have. And when you have a president who has access to all of the scientific information, who can make a phone call and bring every bloody scientist in the world into his office in a few days' notice. When you have a president of the United States who rejects and turns his back on that science, you know, maybe it was a harsh word, uh, but he's called me worse. So, yeah, I mean, I think it is just idiotic. Uh, if you like, uh, that a president, uh, a president takes uh, that ha has that type of approach toward climate change. It, uh, and, and again, it is forget the word idiot. It is so dangerous. It is dangerous. We are the most powerful country on earth. We should be leading the world to a global energy transition. And you have a president who thinks it's not real. That is idiotic. Uh, I want, this is uh, Catherine Guckett. This is Catherine Duckett. She's a climate science professor at Monmouth University, a member of the Long Branch New Jersey Environmental Commission. Catherine? Hey, Catherine. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, I wanted to ask you about FEMA professor rules. Professor Bernie Sanders. FEMA rules. Yeah. Are you in favor of changing FEMA rules Welcome, Paul. to encourage Welcome, retreat Paul. from Paul. properties Say that have Paul. suffered yeah. repeated Paul. catastrophic Paul. losses? Yes. And if so, how would you implement those changes in a way that's fair and equitable? Well, uh, as I understand what you're saying, we have the absurd situation where FEMA will only pay to repair uh, a, a facility or, or an infra piece of infrastructure where it was before it was destroyed. That's pretty stupid. I mean, if it was destroyed once and you rebuild it, it's destroyed twice. Doesn't make a lot of sense to put it there again. So the answer is absolutely. Uh, which raises even the broader question of how we are going to protect communities. Look, we're not going to turn this thing around tomorrow. Uh, I worry very much. I was just in South Carolina last week. Uh, there are scientists who think that parts of Charleston, South Carolina, parts of Miami will be underwater. What do we do to protect those communities? What do we do to protect poor people and people of color, by the way, who are often the hardest hit by environmental degradation and the impact of climate change? And we have substantial sums of money uh, to do that as well. So would people on, in coastal communities who have a house right on the beach, uh, would they have to move? Well, that we, that I don't think it makes a lot of sense to rebuild that house so that it is, you know, knocked down again in the next storm. Uh, and so what how do you, you make that happen as president? 
Well, you know, all of the, well, you do your best at, through carrots and sticks at the federal level. But, I, you know, if people want to uh, rebuild in an area which will be devastated by the next storm, they're certainly not going to get any federal assistance from my administration to do that. Let, let me just quickly ask you about, about cars, electric cars. Yep. Everybody, obviously, we all love our cars and trucks. How do you manage to get people to relinquish, you know, the car they love for some, a car, an electric car that may be slower or less less powerful wow, you initially. Can ask that same well, you do it with expensive. financial yeah. incentives. You make it worth people's while by heavily subsidizing the industry. We can create a whole lot of jobs uh, by moving away from internal They're gonna combustion hit him for that, engine that he cars wants to, give people uh, to electric cars. cars. And every day, tomorrow, these cars are uh, developing a longer range uh, and they're more powerful. But look, at the end of the day. Uh, Anderson, this is where I start from. Uh, if I start from the moral position that we have no choice but to do everything that we can with countries all over the world to save this planet for our children and future generations. And that will mean change. That will mean change. And uh, I think that what a president of the United States has got to do is make it clear to the people of our country and the world what the dangers are if we do not act. What is the alternative? Nobody in this room, just think about it, 30 years from now, wants to look your kid or your grandchild in the eye and have that child say to you, you know, Grandpa, you knew, you knew back in 2020, 2019, what the scientists were saying, you didn't do anything, and look what you created. Look at the world that you gave me. Yeah. That is not anything that I want anybody in this room or in this country to have to face. We have a, a video from uh, a questioner, Rachel Duvac is her name. She's a retired minister and a psychologist from Denver, Colorado. Rachel. As we move toward trying to save our planet, how will you address the concerns of businesses, especially small ones, who will be expected to conform to changes in the law to protect our environment that might cost them money, uh -huh. i.e. Yeah. using sustainable products? Well, what, you know, the reason we are making such a big investment uh, is to incentivize and protect small businesses and homeowners all, all over this country. Uh, my goal is to see a massive increase in the use of wind and solar, uh, and we will help people uh, being able to afford uh, to pay for it. I'll give you just an example of one of the crazy things that goes on right now. Uh, if you install, and we have, uh, Jane and I have put solar on our house, and it turns out with the tax credits that we got, we pay it off in seven or eight years, and then we have free electricity. It's a pretty good investment. We can't afford to do that. There are a lot of families that can afford, cannot afford that fifteen or $16,000. So we're going to make it possible to lend those people that money to put the solar up on their roofs. They will not be paying a nickel more than they're currently paying for electricity and then they're going to have free electricity after that. That is a sane in approach, which also creates jobs. Those are the kinds of things that we want to do for small business and homeowners. Let, let me just ask you, you know, during a war, during a crisis, uh, presidents in the past have asked Americans to, to sacrifice in different ways. I guess for someone listening at home tonight, what is the greatest personal sacrifice you are asking an American to make for climate change, to, 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 to stop climate change? Well, I think we are, you know, we're going to have to change. Um, we're going to have to change the nature of many of the things that we're doing right now, many of the products that we're using. You used an example. There are people who like their car, which is a, an internal combustion engine. And we're going to have to say to those people, please, let's work together to save the planet. Maybe people like old fashioned light bulbs. We're going to have to say we can save an enormous amount of uh, electricity by using uh, LEDs. Um, so I think that in its totality, uh, what we are saying to people that uh, in agriculture, for example, uh, we are saying that we're going to end factory farming because that is not only that is a danger to the environment and to climate change. And, you know, there will be a transition. There will be a transition and, and, and there will be some pain there. We're going to put money into protecting family-based agriculture. 
where people can, instead of having products, food products, transported all over from the, all over the world or all over the country, you can get that food to do every as much as we can get it locally. So there's going to be change, and we're going to have to ask people to understand that we have got to make those changes now, even though they may be a little bit uncomfortable, for the sake of future generations. Uh, Senator Sanders, I appreciate your time. Thank you Thank very much. You. Let's talk about the electric car one. Uh, Andrew Yang and Vice, former Vice President Joe Biden were given softball questions about the electric car. Like, will you support or will you call for the use of the electric car? And then Anderson Cooper's question about the electric car was more detail. Like, what are you planning on doing this? These and cars this? suck. Everyone hates them. How yeah. come you want to cram them down everyone's throats? Oh, exactly. That's the framing exactly. of it. How they are cheap framing. and bad cars, whereas, and why do you want people to use them? Whereas if you compare that to... If you compare that to Yang and Vice President Joe Biden's softball question, mm -hmm. very softball question, you could tell that corporate media is doing everything it can to discredit Biden. And I'm very curious to see how the Warren town hall will go. Right. The other and, the other framing there that was the follow up to the car question was, you know, oh, how many how many things are the the average American going to have to change about the routine like where where what's the bitter pill we're gonna have to you swallow have to, a new car oh that sounds terrible i never want new vehicles oh no cheaper so energy at home right no that sounds terrible what, oh we're saving the what planet. are all the terrible things that we're gonna have to do tell so, us all the bad stuff see, here's, bernie tell here's us all the, the oh, bad stuff here's the only thing that some people might consider bad and i actually consider good i've been calling it for like I love a good steak. Kit can concur. Paul yeah. can concur. We I, like I, I, yeah. I meat's I, way too cheap. Meat is I way like too steak. cheap. I want to eat. If I lived in a world where I would ate, what I ate meat far less often, but the quality was far better. I mean, I remember when I went to Europe. Meat's a lot more expensive there, but it's so much better. That's a better world for me. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe the only thing that you can't get a, a, a Big Mac for whatever, $4 or whatever. Maybe it's 7 Ooh, it's it, – what really it is is a lot of these big corporations are going to have some very hard crunch times. Mm -hmm. That's really what it comes down it to. It doesn't. It doesn't end up falling on the average American mm -hmm. citizen. Like they're like the average American citizen doesn't really feel a pinch from their electricity bill getting cheaper yeah. because they're using renewable energy. Ooh. But Exxon Mobil feels a pinch. Yeah. From no longer getting all of the subsidies that they're currently getting, from actually having to pay taxes again, from actually not allowing their you know commodity to be so subsidized that it sells itself for its own profit like it's yeah. yeah yeah they're gonna feel the pinch but they oh. want to frame it that, oh but one of, one of the small businesses that lady that, that phoned in that question that question is just horrible oh uh, these small businesses they're gonna have to pay more money or it's a, against the economy you know what he, here's here's something you know what you know what small business have to do a lot of right now have trouble getting customers because their customers are too poor to buy their products oh and another thing too i want to read a uh, shout out from the chat but uh Raul Takar, uh, you get a Tesla. You get a Tesla. <laughs> we all get Tesla. That sounds terrible. I would love I, that. I so would, I'm Daniel. not sure if I could survive if I got a free I, Tesla. I, I, oh, I, what I, would I do? I have to say this. Before August ended, I actually had a chance to go inside a Tesla dealership. Cool. I had a lot of fun there. Yeah. It, it, it was fun. I sent you pictures of it. Yeah, I, I had fun. I had fun. And you know what? Imagine a better world where we actually had fuel okay. efficient cars. Let's let's right now. Let's imagine this terrible world that Bernie Sanders is describing. We have electric cars, which if you think Tesla, pretty terrible. Yeah. You have housing that basically costs no money and electricity and utilities are very cheap. The you can drink tap water because you don't have to buy bottled water because the pipes are clean no and no and there's no lead in it. Terrible, I know. Uh, there are wind farms everywhere, and you get that windmill cancer that but Donald how Trump are you talks about. Pay for it. 